Tonight we're in Hebrews chapter number 13, so this is the final chapter, of course, in the book of Hebrews. Uh, this is would be uh, technically uh, the 15th week, I guess, because we split Hebrews chapter number 10 in half, and then we also had an introduction uh, to the uh, book of Hebrews itself. But uh, the book of Hebrews is an extremely deep book. It is, I would say, by far the deepest book uh, in the entire Bible. It's definitely the deepest book in the New Testament. Uh, there are some you know, difficult books that have just uh, uh, have some very deep prophecies, just layers of truths in the Old Testament as well, in the book of Isaiah, and then also in the book of Jeremiah. But as far as in the New Testament, it starts to become new do more doctrinally, and especially with Paul, and it becomes you know, uh, much, much uh, uh, more difficult to follow sometimes because there are multiple doctrines doctrines that are kind of intertwined with one another. So Hebrews chapter number 13 is the conclusion of the book of Hebrews, which as I said is a very deep doctrinal book. So it's going to be touching on some of those doctrines throughout this chapter. So of course you wouldn't be able to just pick up, just like you could in a lot of books, uh, just Hebrews 13 and read it just by itself and it make perfect sense without reading the previous 12 chapters. Now in a lot of other books it would have been easier to do that. But Hebrews 13, my point is this, it's going to be referencing a lot of the deeper doctrines that were spoken of in the previous chapters. But also it's going to do this, and this is another proof that Paul is the author. It's going to just give kind of unrelated exhortations. A lot of statements that are somewhat unrelated. Of course there is some continuity, but what he'll branch out more so where it's not just this continual you know, thought of continuity or consciousness. And Paul does that constantly throughout his writings and, and that, that happens <coughs> excuse me, very much so in Hebrews chapter number 13 as well. So in, starting in uh, verse number, really verse number 23, he just gives kind of salutations and more personal information at the very end of the chapter. And previous to that, uh, he's just kind of exhorting them. So if I had to summarize the chapter of Hebrews 13, I would say that the chapter is a, a chapter of exhortation and he's doing so while relating many of the doctrines that he has already taught or spoken about in the previous 12 chapters. And that's all the way up to about, you know, verse 22 actually. I would say verse 22 because that's where he makes that statement, and I beseech you. So right here is where he starts to more so get into his closing or his salutation. He mentions Timothy. He's the one, I believe, delivering the letter. And then he also tells them to salute one another and things along that sort. So that's the breakdown or the overview of the chapter. So let's dive into it beginning with verse number 1. It starts out and it says, let brotherly love continue. So that's a, one of those short statements. It's a powerful statement. You see that being harped on repeatedly in every book in the New Testament. How important it is to have brotherly love. To love your brother or your sister in Christ. So it says, let brotherly love continue. And it says in verse 2, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels Unawares. Now that's one of those verses that's just extremely interesting. So he tells you, hey, you yourself, talking to the Hebrews, right? Just the random Jews at that time. He's telling them, be not forgetful to entertain strangers. And what does he mean by that? When he says entertain, you know, he's not, you know, in the sense oftentimes how we talk about entertaining someone. He's speaking in regards of hospitality. Of, you know, maybe someone needs lodging. Maybe someone needs you to give them a ride. Maybe somebody needs you to do whatever it may be, you know, for them and for and, and, for you to be with them during a period of time, and more so lodging is probably where this would apply the most, but uh, that is what he's referring to. It's, a, it's a, that type of hospitality. And he says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, and then he says this, for thereby, meaning when people have been entertaining strangers, some have entertained angels unawares. And the perfect example of this, I believe, is in Genesis chapter number 19. Genesis chapter number 19, Lot's in the city and two men come in. And he has no idea that these are angels. Two men, just normal men, come into the city. And he just invites them on into the, his house. He's being hospitable to them. He brings them on in. And these are creatures you know, which are celestial creatures. These are creatures that their habitations or their uh, dwelling place is with the Lord permanently day after day after day. And Lot doesn't have a clue. They just come into the city. They look completely normal, obviously. This is a good teaching about angels that there are many angels or a sect of angels that just appear as we do as men. He just invites them on, you know, into his house. And, and you know what he did? 
He entertained angels unawares. He was entertaining an angel and he had no idea that this was actually an angel or a messenger sent directly from God. So we see let brotherly love continue. The importance of having brotherly love. The importance of loving one another. You know, this is the, uh, uh, considered the, uh, the greatest commandment in 1 John is spoken of, right? The new commandment, that is. Uh, we, so we see let brotherly love. We see, you know, hospitality being exhorted to be hospitable and, and a warning given. And this is, of course, profitable to you as well. You never know. There could be a time, just like Lot. You know, we don't, you know, some people today think that, that they will, you know, that it's not possible, <clears throat> uh, you know, for any miracles to occur or anything like that. Obviously, we'd live in a different day and age as far as how God is, we live in a different dispensation. No, I'm just kidding. We live in a different day and age as far as how God is dealing with us right now. The, you know, the last apostle, that's basically the last prophet of the New Testament. He's done and gone, right? That was Paul. But then, of course, the next thing we're looking forward to is, you know, the tribulation is going to begin. But, there's going to be, you know, miraculous things that happen again in the future. That doesn't mean that God may, you know, uh, may, uh, that, that it's not possible that God may actually send a messenger or an angel here. That God may, you know, uh, intervene divinely. I believe that he still does do things like that. So it's possible that you yourself, this is profitable to you yourself. It's possible that you yourself one day may have an opportunity to entertain an angel. You may have an opportunity where a stranger, you know, comes to your house or whatever it may be. And he needs help or whatever. It, it, you, know, you, you don't know the exact situation. And it's important that you be hospitable to him. We as Christians should be hospitable. It says in verse number 3, Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. And them which suffer, suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. So he's telling them to, to remember those that are being persecuted basically. And specifically he mentions first those that are in bonds. These are those that are arrested, they're in captivity, right? Then he talks about them which suffer adversity. That's any kind of like, you know, uh, uh, persecution or tribulation. Adversity is just an enemy. It's someone being against you, right? So... He, the overall thought is, you know, any person, it's kind of summarized with adversity. Anybody going through a hard time, a tribulation, remember them. But he gives them also a second thought connected to both statements. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. So the way we need to remember them is as we were going through that, right? And he says the same thing afterwards with the second statement. And them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. So those that are going through, you know, uh, maybe being arrested or being persecuted to the point of uh, being jailed for the cause of Christ, we need to remember them and, and put yourself in their shoes, basically. Think about if you were going through, the, through with this, if you were having to go through this. But then also those that are suffering adversity. Maybe those that were beaten or those that are persecuted for the cause of Christ and are going through hard times. Like if you were again in their shoes, like if you were having to go through that, that's how we need to remember them in our own minds and think about them. It'll cause you to care more about them. It'll cause you to put more care. Now this is empathy is what this is referred to as. I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 12. And this again proves over and over and over again you can see the style of, the, of Paul's um, writings with uh, the author of the book of Hebrews. I want you to notice the order of these things. Look at Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 12. It says this, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, constant, or I'm sorry, continuing, instant in prayer. Then it says this, Distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Now if you remember, that is how Hebrews 13 began. It said specifically, Distributing to the necessity of saints. So first off, it said distributing to the necessity of saints in Romans chapter number 12, verse number 12. And in Hebrews 13, remember, it speaks of let brotherly love continue. There we have the saints mentioned. And then, it's, and then it speaks of hospitality in verse number 2. Well, Romans chapter 12, verse 13 first mentions the saints, then mentions hospitality. Now look at verse 14 in Romans chapter 12. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. What is that? What is he describing there? He's describing empathy, isn't he? He's, he's telling you that when someone is going through a hard time, you need to try to be empathetic to them. You need to try to mirror their feelings. You need to try to put yourself in their shoes. It helps you to try to you know, uh, 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 feel how they feel 
in order to comfort them. It will help you to be a better comforter if you could understand what they were going through. You know, people oftentimes are comforted by a person that they know has already went through what they're going through. That is comforting. You know, the thought of knowing that Jesus Christ walked in my shoes and was actually a man and went through, you know, a lot of the things that I go through, a lot of the heartaches and the problems and the troubles with life, that's comforting to me. And you know what else is comforting? Is when you yourself would you know, uh, uh, maybe go through something. You've went through a, a problem or a trial in your life and let's say maybe fast forward two years later and you have maybe a brother or sister in the, in the same church that you attend if they go through that same problem. You know what would be comforting to them if you were to go to them and give them, you know, your testimony and encourage them and they would feel as if they could relate to you. You know, that's one of the things that's comforting about having Jesus Christ as our mediator. He's, he can, you know, relate to us. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, right? So that's what this is speaking about here. It makes people feel better, you know, when you will have empathy with them. Them, when you will, you know, mirror their feelings. When they feel like, you know, that you are going through the same problems and the same troubles and trials with them, that makes it easier on them. That makes it easier for them. So notice that there in, in Romans chapter number 12, we see the same order of things being taught. Brotherly love talks about distributing to the necessity of the saints. Talks about, you know, hospitality. We have the same order here in Hebrews 13. And then it gets to empathy. And what do we have in Hebrews 13, verse number 3? Empathy. Both passages, also in Romans 12. Empathy. In that order. Then we have in verse number 4, the Bible tells us this. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So notice that these are somewhat unrelated statements. And that is a fearful statement after we just read chapter after chapter after chapter about the chastisement of the Lord, about the wrath of the Lord, about the characteristics of the Lord, of His justice, about His anger, about how the fact that He will not allow you to get away with it. Now that you're in the New Testament, yes, it's, you know, it's, it's easy to be saved, but once you're saved, you're going to be judged more harshly. You're going to be judged more severely because what you would be doing is being irreverent to the blood of Christ, to the blood of God's only begotten Son. So here we see the warning to you know, whoremongers and adulterers. It tells you God will judge. Verse 5, and this is kind of uh, 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 in tandem with that. These are running together, of course. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with, the, with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So notice there in the beginning of verse 5, it gives you the statement, let your conversation be without covetousness. A lot of times we think of covetousness, you know, we think of just uh, coveting for something that is materialistic. You know, maybe an object. But also you can be, you, you know, it's considered covetousness if you were to look at a woman that is not your wife and to desire her. If you were to look at, you know, a, if you were married or even if you, let's say you were not married and to look at something that does not belong to you. And uh, of course here in context it's speaking about a married man. It would be a man that would be committing adultery. Now, all sin begins with covetousness. You know, the Bible's real clear about that. All sin begins with covetousness. The sin begins in your mind first. You commit this sin in your mind. And then there's a time in which you decide to go after this sin. So covetousness should be something that we guard our hearts from. And of course, I preached a sermon on this and the importance of it. And I talked about the warning of covetousness. Jesus said the words, beware of covetousness. Because it's such a... It, it's 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 because it is the gateway sin. Let me word it that way. It's so dangerous. It's such a dangerous sin because it is the gateway sin. It is the sin that leads to all other sins. So here, you know, the covetousness is actually, I believe, being tied in with verse number four. After, and uh, that is lusting after another woman that is not your wife or uh, coveting a woman that is not your wife. And then he tells you this. After the warning of covetousness, he says, and be content with such things as ye have. So whatever we have, we should be content with it. With whatever you have. 
You know, the, this is taught throughout the Bible over and over again. Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. So that is being rich, that is being poor, that is being persecuted, that is being joyful. In whatever state that we find ourselves, we should be happy with it. With whatever amount of money that we make, with whatever you know, house that we have, with whatever we may have, we should be happy and content with the conditions that our life is in. We should just be happy with what we have. And why should we? There's a good consolation here. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Why should you be content with such things you have? Because you have Christ. That's what he's telling you. Be content with such things you have and then he tells you something that you have. Something that's better than any physical possession or anything that you have in this world or in any world that's you know, uh, uh, to come or possible. There's nothing better than having Christ. You can't imagine anything better than having you know, God as your Savior or God as your Father. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So you can always have that. And this is a great verse on eternal security. On, on not losing your salvation... He's giving them words of exhortation, but he's also here trying to encourage them and to not go into sin because of this. And what is it? He's saying, you don't need to seek after all these things. Be happy with what you have because I'm never going to leave you nor forsake sake you. You know what he's saying? You'll always have me. That's comforting, man. You stop and think about that. That's what he, that is his point. I will always be there for you. Now, if you could lose your salvation, this makes no sense. Because if you could lose your salvation, it would not be true for him to say, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. If he, let's say that you sinned. I mean, let's stop and break this down and think about it. Let's say that particular sins, like people will say, would cause you to lose your salvation. Could Christ really say, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee? Could he really say that? He could not. Would that be true? No. He'd be like, except, you know, if you commit a mortal sin. Or except if you, you know, and he just got done talking about adultery. I mean, that's a pretty stinking bad sin, right. you know? Obviously, it's, you know, the, 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 the teaching of eternal security should never, you know, try to, uh, uh, should never prod you to go into sin. Of course, that's not the purpose of it, and the Bible is, is, is far from teaching that. The Bible's super clear. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. But what is the Bible's teaching? I don't care if you logically think, well, that, you know, that gives you a license to sin. That you know, will just encourage people to live uh, you know, a sinful life. Oh, really? Because it looked like in the previous verse right before it, it said, whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So it doesn't sound like he's just giving you a license to sin. But it doesn't matter however you look at this verse because the Bible plainly says... I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. The Bible tells us nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And then he goes through a big long list of everything imaginable. He talks about height, depth. You know, he goes through things, things present, things to come. He's going through like all the dimensions of space. He's saying anything, anywhere, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, uh, uh, immaterial, material, everything. Everything in existence. Anything you could think of. And these fools that believe you can lose your salvation, they try to like be tricky with words. You know, like John 10, 28. Yeah, you know, no man can pluck you out of his hand, but you can jump out of his hand. Obviously, you're missing the point of that verse, number one. But what do you have to say about Romans chapter number eight? I mean, he just goes through every single thing possible to explain to you and to make it clear in your mind that he will never leave you nor forsake you. That is comforting. And it never loses its comfort. Just to know that I will always be saved no matter what. A thousand years from now, I will still be saved. Amen. A trillion years from now, I will still be saved. And guess what? He will never leave me nor forsake me. Right. That's comforting. And then he says this. Look at verse 6. So that we may boldly say... The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I hope that you're recognizing this pattern repeatedly throughout the book of Hebrews where he, he, he tries to embolden the reader. Where he talks about how the, blood of, how the blood of Christ is better so that we may boldly approach the throne. He talks about all of these different things. How we have a stronger refuge than the Levites. Now we have Jesus Christ entering in for us and the high priest so we can boldly approach the throne. I mean, this is over and over and over again. And like I said... It's, a, it's a, a, a book of exhortation to try to instill in you patience. And keep in mind, patience means to endure. To try to instill in you the importance of continuing in the fight. To enduring in the Christian life and in the Christian fight. So there again, he's giving you another encouragement. We've seen these over and over again. And the encouragement is, 
We'll never lose our salvation. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Remember another one in Hebrews chapter number 6. The whole point of that passage, even after he talks about the punishments that would go to the Christian, the whole point of the passage, he, he goes to Abraham and he talks about how to Abraham, you know, uh, God uh, uh, gave the promise. And he said, obviously God can't lie. And God gave a vow anyways. So in that, there were two immutable things. So that we could, we could uh, uh, seek for refuge. He would, we would have a strong consolation. That they who fled for refuge would have a strong consolation. So notice again, same teaching. You could be confident about it. You could be bold about it. Knowing that He is faithful. He will not lie to you. And He says that I will never leave you nor forsake you. So I wanted to point out that consistency to help you kind of tie some of these common threads, common streams uh, throughout the book of Hebrews. Then it says in verse number 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Uh, quickly, uh, you just stay there actually, just because I don't want to take up too much time. We're only on verse 6 so far. So <clears throat> I'm going to read to you where this is quoted from. I just want you to see the little bit of a difference uh, that takes place in quotations. You, I'm sure you've seen it many other times. But here in Psalm chapter number 118, verse number 6 is actually where this is quoting. And it says this, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man... Uh, can, what man can do unto me. So he says, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. There in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 6 again it says, so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Verse number 7, it says this, remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. So here, of course, this is mentioning pastors. This is mentioning uh, you know, those that are the rulers of the church. Of course, the rulers of the church would be the pastor. That is who is referred to as that. Uh, he's given the title also of a bishop. And what is the job of the bishop? He is also supposed to teach them or feed them the word of God. That's why he's, uh, bishop and shepherd or pastor are used in her changeably and here you see that those that are ruling are the ones that have spoken unto you the word of God they're the teachers of the word of God and then it says whose faith follow so they need to be examples for the rest of the church and then it says considering the end of their conversation saying you know look at basically uh, um, you know look at their lives and see where the you know the end of their conversation because the word conversation means live you know uh, the way that you live their life your lifestyle that's what that's referring to verse 8 says this Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. So that's a great verse, you know, showing that Jesus Christ is God. That is what that is teaching. Malachi chapter number 3 verse 6 is the famous passage in the Old Testament uh, where the Lord said, He says, I am the Lord, I change not. It's a good passage to, to uh, reference, uh, to, to be basically a good parallel for that. Here it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever forever. He's never changing. Now people of course have tried to teach, and I don't want to dive into this because the book of Hebrews has hit on this quite a bit, uh, so I've touched on it. They've tried to teach the, uh, the false teaching uh, that Jesus Christ has eternally been a man, which is, is, is a strange, bizarre type of teaching, and uh, they would use this as uh, a proof of that. And obviously this is referring to his deity. This is referring to him as being God. You know, he's not been the same. And then they'll try to use this to say that he's always had flesh. It's like you have just extrapolated that verse just to a ridiculous degree. So here, what it's talking about is that he's faithful. What is the context about? About him being faithful. Right before that verse 6, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do in it. What is that talking about? He's right before, what was the statement before that? I will never leave thee nor forsake. It's talking about him being faithful. In what area specifically is it saying, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? It's saying he's faithful. He's, not like, he's, he's, a, he's a rock that you can put your faith in, and he's faithful to his promises. Like he says in Psalm chapter 89, I will not lie unto David. In hope of eternal life, it says in Titus 1-2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Do you know what this verse really specifically means? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, he's a faithful God. He's still faithful to his promise just like he was yesterday. You know, you may give me a promise and it's, and it's, and it's very possible that you may back out on that promise. You cannot trust man. And that's what he just paralleled that with, if you remember in verse number 6. You know, uh, uh, he talks about 
man trying to harm him and hurt him. How you can't trust man, basically. But the Lord's a helper. The Lord's there and he's your strength, right? So verse number 9, Be not carried about with divers and, and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. <coughs> Excuse me. Not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied thereby. Of course, this applies in a wide uh, 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 array or wide variety of false doctrines or to a wide variety of false doctrines here. There are many divers and strange doctrines out there. There are many of them. You know, Nephilim. I mean, you could just go through uh, uh, just the list. Dispensationalism. All different types of strange doctrines. The, the, the doctrine of Abraham's bosom. When I preached that sermon, you know, I guess it's like four years ago now. That's crazy. Five years ago. Uh, when I preached that sermon, it was, I started off on, with this passage. Because it's a strange doctrine. The book, the, the, the teaching of Abraham's bosom, that saved believers go to this little compartment inside the earth. You know, that's under your feet after the Bible tells you hell is under your feet repeatedly. Hell is in the core of the earth. Hell is in the center of the earth. And they can like see people being tormented, but it's still called paradise. And they're like trapped inside here, but they're kind of saved, but not really saved because they're waiting on Jesus Christ. Is a very strange doctrine. It's, yeah. it's a weird teaching, and it's, and it's unbiblical. And it's basically, and it's sad that when people, you know, that are honest that fall into this, it's a cover for every other teaching in dispensationalism. That's what it comes down to. It's basically, they have to have a place, if salvation is not by grace through faith alone, and that they're waiting for the blood, then they have to have a place to put these people until Jesus Christ dies. So, well... I guess the center of the earth is the only option, you know. So that's basically where that comes from. They, you know, they got to fix all these things, right? All these problems that... Because when you mess with the Bible, it's so perfect, you're going to have to correct it somewhere else. If you move something around, it's so intricate and so precise, you're going to have to fix it somewhere. You're going to mess something else up somewhere else. Um, so right here, though, he's warning them specifically in verse uh, 8, or verse 9, I'm sorry. In verse 9, he's warning them more so about uh, 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 false teachings of Judaism. Because notice how he talks about, you know, uh, doctrines of meats. Not with meats, right? Don't be carried about with these divers and strange doctrines that have to do with meats, like foods and, and different types of sacrifices and things like that, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Referring to the sacrifices, saying they haven't really profited them. What, was, what did it mention many times throughout the book, of he, uh, uh, the book of Hebrews, and particularly Hebrews 10? That the sacrifices didn't profit them, right? It was not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. So he's, he's, be, he's trying to, to teach them to beware of some of the false teachings that Judaism is teaching now. That, hey, these things are actually taking away your sins. You don't need the blood of Christ. You know, this is going to take away all of your sins or whatever type of twist that they had on it at that time. And he contrasts their altar with our altar. Look at verse 10 to show that that's what he's talking about. We have an altar whereof... They have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. So notice that. That's what he was talking about in verse number 9. And he says, we have an altar. And where's our altar? He talked about the altar in heaven, right? Before. Whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. Why is that? Because they're still under the old covenant. They're not in the new covenant. So they don't have... The, you know how you get the right? I mean, think about that. God gives you the right... To, to partake of that altar and to come before that altar and to come, you know, uh, of course, to heaven and before the throne of God. You know how? You have to believe in the blood that's on the altar. You have to put your faith in the blood that's on the altar and then he gives you the right to partake and to come towards that altar. Uh, verse 11, For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sins are burned without the camp. Wherefore, verse 12, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Now, I don't have this passage here, but he's referencing a process that they would go through for uh, the remission of sins for the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, right? And of course, it was not spiritual, it was physical. Um, it wasn't saving their soul. And... If you notice there, he talks about how, how uh, Jesus also, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the camp. So when they would take that, that, uh, you know, that lamb or that ram that they would take, or the goat offering, when they would take that without the camp, after they had slain it, that was a picture of Jesus Christ. Because remember, Jesus Christ didn't die in the tabernacle in that sense. Jesus Christ didn't die right there in the city. Where did Jesus Christ die? He died outside the city. He carried his cross up the hill. 
So notice when they were doing that, that was precise and that had, that, they, they may not have understood that, but when every year when they would take that lamb or they would take that goat or whatever it was that time, that sin offering, and they would carry that sin offering outside the city, do you know what they were playing out? They were playing out Jesus carrying his cross. That's interesting. That's actually what they were actually, you know, they were, they were just uh, acting that whole thing out. Well, they were carrying that ram or they were carrying that goat, whatever it may have been, because uh, they had the option of either. They, uh, they, were, they were acting that out. And then, you know, years later, of course, uh, you know, uh, thousands since the point that uh, Moses actually was on the earth and implemented that, uh, Jesus Christ came along and he carried his cross, what that was actually pointing to uh, all along. So he did that. He suffered without the gate. Verse 13, let us go forth therefore, meaning because he did. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. So what is that referring to when it says, let us go, there, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach? Let me remind you, what is the book of Hebrews about? Enduring. Enduring what? Persecution. What was Jesus doing when he went without the camp? He was carrying his cross. So when he tells you, let us go forth, let us go forth, therefore, Michaela, sit up now. Put your feet down and sit up now. He says, let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp. I haven't had to do that in a long time. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. You know what he's saying? You need to pick up your cross and carry it too. Notice the consistency. What did Jesus say? That's obviously, that was something that Jesus himself specifically taught. You know, pick up your cross and carry it, come and follow me. What's Paul saying? Pick up your cross and follow Christ. Follow Christ and bear your reproach. And what is he saying? Endure persecutions. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. Endure, endure, endure persecutions. And notice a lot of times he drops little hints towards the fact that you may be enduring more persecutions here soon. You have not yet strived unto blood, right? Then he says in verse 14, for, meaning because, here, we, here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. He's saying this isn't our world anyways. This isn't our home. You know, we're just strangers. We're pilgrims. We have no continuing city here. This is also uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, giveaways that the, that the book is written to Hebrews or Jews because that was their city prior to that. But it's saying now we have no continuing city. We're being persecuted by, by those that are in Jerusalem. And we don't have a continuing city, but we seek one to come. That's talking about the new Jerusalem that's going to come down from heaven, of course. So he's contrasting there Jerusalem, which now is, which is in uh, bondage with her children, but also Jerusalem, which is above, which is free, which is the mother of us all, as Galatians tells us. Verse 15, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. We should thank God regularly. We should, when we get opportunities, of course we can do this in prayer, but we should thank God for the great things that he's done Amen. for us. When we get an opportunity, just tell, you know, you don't have to be all super Pentecostal spiritual, but you can tell somebody, you know, about something maybe God did for you in your life, maybe when they come into church and say, hey man, God really blessed me. I wasn't expecting it, but thank the Lord, you know, he did this, this, and this for me. Let it come from a sincere heart if you're thankful for it. And you know what? That can be an encouragement for another uh, person and you also you're setting a good example for them as well. They'll start doing that. It's a commandment from the Lord. And oftentimes when, you, when uh, you get yourself to do these types of things, even if it's awkward in the beginning or whatever, uh, it becomes normal over time and routine, but also it makes you feel good when you, when you, uh, you, know, you praise God and you thank God for the great things that He's done for you. Oftentimes it'll make you feel good because then it causes you to reflect on all the great things that you have in your life. And we don't do that enough. We, we don't realize how uh, uh, grateful uh, or how blessed we are here and how grateful we should be for it. Look at verse 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So a few different types of sacrifices, uh, uh, as far as referring to them as analogies, is thanking God and then also to do good. And then it says, and to communicate. And to communicate is talking about giving. It's talking about giving offerings. You, know, you could say your tithe or you know, charitable offerings. And then he says, uh, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Man, that is like my life verse right now. No, I'm just kidding. But I will say this, you know, uh, 
you know, I had no idea, you know, just to give you just my own personal testimony of being a pastor for, you know, almost getting close to two years. I heard people talk about how difficult it was, those that have personally experienced it, how hard it is to pastor, all the different things that they had to deal with. And I'm not just saying this now that I'm in the club. Now I have to say that or whatever it may be. It's the hardest thing that I've ever done by far. It is so mentally stressful. It is just, uh, it's, it's very strenuous on your mind. I mean, you know, it starts affecting your body. I have multiple gray hairs now in my head. I mean, it is extremely stressful. Just constantly thinking about things. You know, any problem that anybody, you know, it's because of the responsibility, you know, that comes with being a pastor. So any problem that ever occurs in anyone's life that attends the church, it just causes you to just constantly think about it. Just all the time. And of course, churches have problems, many problems. It always happens with every church. There's always going to be disagreements and things like that. And it's way different when you're the church member than when you're the pastor. Because obviously, you, now you have responsibility. Notice what it says. For they watch for your souls. You know, that is the job of the pastors, to look out for the sheep. It's the shepherd. What does the shepherd do? He guards against wolves. That's why he's got to stay awake at night. That's why he's got to walk around and keep checking them and watching them because that is his job to make sure that, you know, that there aren't any problems, that there aren't any issues. You know, not only that, if there's maybe a sick sheep or maybe a sheep that's lost or maybe a sheep that's confused or whatever it may be. You know, any problem that arises with the sheep, it's the shepherd's job to fix it. And that is, it's a big responsibility and it becomes stressful. And you know, notice what it says this. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account. And then he says this, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Notice it says that they may do it with joy and not with grief. What's the implication there? Why do you warn against things? Because they're, they're, they're frequent. Because it's very, very possible that they're going to occur. That's why you bring them up. You're not going to bring something up that's not going to happen or doesn't happen often. Obviously, you're more so going to warn somebody about something that is probable, right? That happens often. And you notice what it says, that they may do it with grief. Or I'm sorry, that they may, please know, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. So notice that it says, he, that try, try to be a good church member, basically. Obey them and, and go along and be a good church member so that they, you can make their life easier, that they can do it with joy, they can be happy to be your pastor, so they can be happy to help you with your problems. If the worse, the, the, the worse of a church member that you are, obviously the less joyful or happy the pastor is going to be when you have a problem to help you. I mean, it's just, it's just human nature and it's just common sense. But the better church member that you are, the, the more willing, the more happy, and the more joyful that the pastor is going to be to want to give you a hand and try to help you in any area. Now, a pastor should help his sheep no matter what anyways. But we're just talking about, you know, doing it with joy and not with grief, right? You know, it, 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 when there's an issue that arises, you know, be the peacemaker. Be the one that's trying to fix things. Don't be the troublemaker. Don't be, you know, thou art he that troubleth Israel, right? Don't be, don't be the, the troublemaker. You know, try to fix things. Try to make things easier, right? Because there's a lot of responsibility and there's a lot of taxing that goes on in your mind when you become a pastor. Whether, you know, that, that, I'm sure that that's not, even when I you know, saw it firsthand, I wanted to be a pastor. I read books about being a pastor. I've read a couple of books by Jack Hiles. I've looked into this kind of stuff a lot. I had no idea. It was like, this is going to be awesome. And then it was like, what have I done? No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm told, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't change anything. Not even a chance. I'm going to pastor the rest of my life. Nothing's changing that. I'm happy with my decision. Very happy with being the pastor of this particular church. Not leaving, not going anywhere. But, but you know, obviously, you know, the, the, the provocation is make it easy on the pastor, right? That's the teaching. Make it easy on the pastor. Be a John the Baptist church member, right? Be the kind of guy that's, that's uh, you know, increasing Christ, decreasing yourself. Putting others first. Be a peacemaker, right? And, you know, a lot of people have problems with, you know, the first part of verse number 17 where it tells you to obey them that have the rule over you. There are people in the church that have the rule over you. And you know who it is? It's those that, that, that teach you or speak unto you, as it says in the previous verse, the Word of God. That's the pastor. You know, that's not the deacons. Remember, the deacons in the book of Acts actually were supposed to do the, the menial tasks, the la laborious and, 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 and manual labor, so that the... Uh, pastors didn't uh, uh, have to leave the Word of God. So that's not the deacons. We're not talking about the deacons here. So you know what that tells you? The deacons don't have rule. 
I want you to think about that. The deacons don't have rule. A lot of these churches, you know what they are? They're deacon-run churches. That violates, this scripture is clear as day. The deacons don't have rule because they don't speak unto you the word of God. Those that speak unto you the word of God are those that have rule, and those are who the church should obey. And that's not the deacons because they're supposed to do the stuff so that the other guys don't have to leave or, 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 or uh, yeah, don't have to leave the word of God. So, there are people in the church to obey. The, you know, you, they are those that have the rule over you. Uh, submit yourselves. And the reason is because they watch for your souls. Verse 18, pray for us. And I believe, you know, in that sense, he's talking about those that are, uh, uh, those that watch for their souls. I think that that's why that comes right after that, right? Because uh, the apostles had kind of a hierarchy position that no longer exists today. And uh, I think he's kind of talking about rulers at this sense. And he just kind of throws in there, pray for us. For we trust, we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. And then he says, but I beseech you rather to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner. What's he talking about? To pray for him, right? To pray for him that I may be restored to you the sooner. So he wants to come to them to see them. And why was he, is he trying to be restored? Because he's in bonds. Well, go to Philippians, the book of Philippians. This is again, I believe, another strong proof. I didn't even point this one out, but it's a very strong proof that this is Paul that's writing. Now, number one, we know he's in bonds. But I want you to notice what he says right here. Look at verse number, Philippians 1, verse 18. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pre pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit, and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Notice that it's the Spirit of Jesus Christ, right? It's talking about the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Like the Spirit of the Father. It's a good verse there. But notice that... Uh, He's talking about his own physical salvation. It's not his, the salvation of his soul, obviously, going to heaven and being saved from his sins or saved from hell. He's talking about the salvation from his bonds. And he's requesting specifically what? Prayer. And he's saying that he believes that he will be delivered out of the bonds through their prayer. The exact same thing that he said in Hebrews chapter 13 there. Another proof, again, I believe, of Paul. There's so many similarities in the writings and, and similar statements that he makes. Verse 20 says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, when it says the God of peace, who is it talking about? What's that? I'm sorry? The Father. Well, it's talking actually, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course it is. Pick one. You'll be right anyways, right? But specifically, if you look at verse 21, it says this, Make you perfect in every good work to do His will. And then watch this. Working in you that which is well-pleasing. So, who's in you? Christ. Right? Christ, the Father, but the Holy Spirit, right? If we were to be real particular, man, this is hard in a one this church. No, I'm just kidding, <laughs> right? No, if we were to you know, look at you know, the, the true Trinity, right? You know, obviously, you have the Holy Spirit that's indwelling you. That's why it's called the Spirit of Christ. Of course, you know, uh, Christ is the Holy Spirit. That is Him. But specifically, it's the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit. You know, that's what's dwelling in us, and that's what's working in us. That is what is in us, right? So, notice there it says, working in you that which is well-pleasing. A further proof of that is who raised Jesus from the dead. I know the Father did. But if we were to think specifically by what uh, um, specific you know, a uh, member of the Trinity raised him from the dead. Who was it? It's the Holy Ghost. Obviously, it was God's Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit, right? You know, the Father Himself in all of His glory did not come down and raise Him from the dead, did He? The Father sent His Spirit. And there is a distinction. Now, obviously, I'm going to need to preach on the, the Trinity again here soon. No, I'm just kidding. But there's, a, there's the, of course, the real distinction between... The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And of course, the Word was made flesh, so there's the additional distinction there. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But the Father in heaven sent His Holy Spirit, and that is what quickened Jesus Christ and raised Jesus from the dead. The, the Holy Spirit is what raised Jesus from the dead. And that's another thing that it tells you there. It says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus. So it was the Holy Ghost that raised Him from the dead. That's what He sent was the Spirit. It was the Spirit of God that raised Him from the dead. That is what's working in you, right? And, and notice that it's called, no, Jesus here, of course, is called that great shepherd. Now, the reason why he's called that great shepherd is because in context, we're talking about other shepherds. You notice that? 
We're talking about other rulers, but right now he's talking about that great shepherd because he is the, he is the shepherd of shepherds. He is, you know, obviously he's the, the over-shepherd, right? He's over top of all the other shepherds, and that's why he's referred to as that great shepherd, saying that large shepherd, or the shepherd that's above all these other shepherds or rulers that we were speaking about. So the, again, showing the rulers are uh, uh, pastors, right? And uh, also I want to point out, now he says the God of peace. Uh, there's a very, very famous chapter in the Bible that talks about peace and comfort and receiving peace and comfort and consolation. It's 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. And that's what 2 Corinthians chapter 1 really focuses on and hits on over and over again. You know, uh, mercies of bowels and peace and comfort and one person comforting another com uh, person with their comfort. And it's talking about the Holy Ghost. Oftentimes the Bible speaks of peace uh, that a, a believer or a saint receives, you know, it's through the Holy Spirit. Because that's how God works with us. That's how God does His work is through the Holy Ghost. He sends the Holy Spirit. That's why it's calling the Holy Ghost here the God of peace. Further proving that the Holy Ghost is God. It is just His Spirit. So this passage is specifically talking about, the, of the three, it's more specifically speaking of the Holy Ghost here. Look at... Verse number uh, 22. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation. Oftentimes, people don't want to suffer the word of exhortation. That's why he's saying that. Oftentimes, people don't want to be exhorted to do more. People don't want to be exhorted to do what's right. Because an exhortation doesn't only have to be positive. You know, an exhortation is, it's not a rebuke, but it is being exhorted to do something, right? Right? It could, be exhort, it could be an exhortation to do what's right, even if you are doing what's wrong at that time. So it is somewhat of a correction, but it's not a rebuke. It's not even necessarily a reproof. It's even a nicer way to try to correct people at times. Of course, it could be an exhortation just to do more. You could be doing good already and just being exhorted to do more. So there's different types of exhortation, but right here notice it says suffer <laughs> exhortation. The word of exhortation, I believe, right? He says... Suffer the word of exhortation. Why? Because sometimes exhortation is telling you to stop doing what's wrong and do what's right. That's also an exhortation. And that's what I believe he's talking about. There's a lot of corrections in this chapter. You know, he's correcting them on a lot of things or, or telling them to beware or, or don't do this, don't do that. So you need to allow or, or take in, accept is what he means, the word of exhortation. Don't reject it. It's what people do oftentimes. For I have written a letter unto you in few words. Verse 23, know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty. So that makes me think that he was in prison with him. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Timothy's the one that sent this letter because he goes on to say when he returns, you know, I, I'm hoping to see you. So he's saying our brother Timothy is set at liberty. That's the one bringing the letter. Who was always with uh, 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 Timothy was Paul. Paul and Timothy, uh, you know, worked together. Uh, Timothy was Paul's protege or his pupil. So he says, Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom if he comes shortly, I will see you. And then he says this, Salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. And then he ends with, Grace be with you all. Amen. So, there at the end of the chapter, of course, we see him mentioning Timothy, as I said already. He talks about he's going to come shortly. He's praying and he's wanting to see them. Uh, verse 24, he says, hey, salute all them that have the rule over you. So in this chapter, three times you have those mentioned, people mentioned that have the rule over you, right? So that's important. We can see that it's important of, to have leadership uh, and also that there is a specific respect that's given to the rulers. Notice that they are singled out. And they are, are uh, 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 singled out and, 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 and given, there's a specific mention of making sure that you salute them, but then there's also a mention, of course, to salute others. So you can see there that there is like the double honor that's mentioned, and then it says, they of Italy salute you, so those that are with uh, uh, the writer, which is Paul, of course, they salute you, and then he ends with grace be with you all, amen. Now I want to hit on one last point right now, and I want to talk about the importance of church. This is how we're going to conclude this. So we have, of course, in Hebrews chapter 10, the most famous uh, uh, verse and, and the most popular verse that is an exhortation to make sure that you go to church. And we have so many different verses in the New Testament that talk about going to church, the importance of church, but you have a command 
in Hebrews chapter number 10. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 10, you have the, uh, the command that's given in verse number 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Now, you know, uh, the, the exhortation to go to church is actually mentioned a few times. It's, it's mentioned again, I'm not going to look at this, in Hebrews 3 and Hebrew, Hebrews 4. It's kind of more so alluded to. Uh, it's, it's implied in Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4. But here we have it very clearly stated. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. So it is a command to go to church. It is a commandment. If you are not in church, you are in sin. So let me repeat that one more time. If you are not in church, you are committing sin. If you're not going to church, you're committing sin. It's a commandment to go to church. Not only that, if you don't go to church, you're more likely to fall into sin. Notice what it says in the very next verse. For, meaning because, if we sin willfully... So notice he's warning you about sinning willfully and about the dangers of sinning willfully in the very next verse. And right before the, the verse here that we see him warning them, the verse right before it is an exhortation. So he's saying, hey, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves you know, together as the manner of some is because if we do sin willfully, we're going to be punished harder. So what does that conclude? What does that teach? It's this. If you're not going to church you're more likely to sin willfully. If you're not in church, you're more likely to fall into sin. You're more likely, if you're not going to church every week, if you're not going to church, you're more likely to get into sin in your life. And to go to the point of sinning willfully, to where you're just openly, willfully, knowingly, you know, committing sin. Now, a lot of people will try to like separate this verse and say, well, what is assembling? What does it mean to assemble? What, is a, what does it mean? Well, the word assembly means congregation. That's very, very clear. In the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 7, I believe, um, uh, Acts chapter 7, I'm almost positive, it quotes the Old Testament. And when it quotes the Old Testament, the word that was used in the Old Testament was congregation. The word that's used in the New Testament is assembly. It actually quotes it and it uses the word, they're used interchangeable. You can do your own study. If I'm wrong about that, search the word assembly. You'll find out that the word assembly is interchangeable with the word congregation. The word congregation means church. They're also used interchangeable. Those three words are interchangeable. An assembly is an organized meeting of people. That's what it is. It's, that is what a congregation is. A congregation and an assembly is people that are assembled together with a, a purpose. There is leadership, there is structure, there, are, uh, or, there is an order of services, just like we're told to have an order of services in 1 Corinthians chapter number uh, uh, 14. We're told to have an order of services. You want to sing, you know, but you, you know, everybody's trying to just do it all at the same time, but you need to have you know, order of these things. This, 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 and this, like we do here. This is a congregation. People assemble together, and there's orders of services, and you know, there's an order that we do things. We have the singer come up. We have the pastor then come up. You know, that's how we do things. That is what an assembly is. That is what it means to assemble yourselves together. That's church, and we are commanded repeatedly, and we're, we're, we're exhorted also on top of that to go to church, and the importance of that. That's, a big, that's mentioned a lot of times in the book of Hebrews. More so a theme in the book of Hebrews than a lot of the other books in the New Testament. The importance of church is spoken of a lot in other books, but specifically he harps on more, you know, make sure you go to church like in, uh, uh, you know, uh, un not uncertain terms in the book of Hebrews. Over and over and over again in the book of Hebrews. Not assembling or not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Now, Notice that he's saying, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And then in Hebrews chapter 13, what does he tell the group to do? The assembly to do? He mentions rulers. Rulers. Because we know what people try to do with Hebrews 10.25. Even though you point out it's an assembly, it's a congregation, there's an order of services. They try to say, well, assembly is like, well, there's two or three gathered together, there am I in the midst. No. That's not an assembly. That's not ever referred to as an assembly, ever. 
Yeah, when brothers and sisters get together and fellowship and two or three are gathered together, there he is in the midst. He can bless that fellowship. You're having conversations about the Word of God. He can bless that. If you're singing hymns even, maybe over at a, a brother or sister's you know, house in the Lord, he could bless that. And he could be there in the midst of that. If you're praying, he could be there in the midst of that and bless that. But that's not an assembly. That's not, that does not qualify for going to church. That is not church. It is a command from Jesus Christ to go to church. Are you a Christian? Do you love the Lord? Do you want to be a good New Testament Christian? Do you want God to be pleased with you? You are commanded to go to church. Amen. It is important to go to church. And that assembly has rulers. This is an organized assembly. That's my point. It's not just two or three coming together. You know, it's not a house church. It's not a home church. There's rulers. And the rulers have qualifications. You know, we have to study all the Bible together. And we have to understand the Bible you know, it's laid out in a very understandable manner on how the local New Testament church is supposed to operate. Church is very important. If you get out of church, you'll get into sin. Right. The devil wants you to get out of church because he knows it's easier to get you into sin. Do you know why? You don't have people around you exhorting you. You don't have people around you, you know, uh, uh, blessing you and shaking your hand and putting you in a good mood. You don't sing the hymns. You don't hear the preaching and the warnings of these types of things. You know, oftentimes, like we've all heard, you know, in our former church, you know what people start to do when they get off on their own? They start to come up with wacky things and saying things that they would have never said. And teaching things or starting to believe things that they would have never taught or believed or thought or anything. You'll hear people that you would have never expected to say something stupid and silly and way out there They'll start saying silly, crazy things. It's important to have the local New Testament church there to keep us anchored and not to, you know, uh, uh, be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. You get off on your, on your own and that's what you're going to do. You're going to start believing weird stuff. You need people to level you out. You need other brothers and sisters to bounce, you know, truths off of. Uh, you know, there are multiple times where I've thought something and brought it up to other people and they've told me from like, they looked at it from a different angle and they're like, nah, you know, and point out like maybe I wasn't thinking about this verse or maybe I've forgotten about this and I thought I was on to something. Maybe I noticed something, but I was going at it at, the, at a weird angle or whatever it may be. I can't think of anything right now or I'd give you an example. But that's happened to me. That happens to everyone. You know, Man is not designed just to just, you know, uh, uh, to not come to an assembly. You know, God did not design it that way. The, the, the local New Testament Christian is not just designed to just, you know, go to work, go home, stay with the family. That's not, that's not how it's supposed to work. Right. You need church. Church is important. There are things you can get from church you can't get anywhere else. Amen. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter number 4, it talks about that he gave the church, he gave different gifts to different people in the church. He gave some, he gave some pastors, you know, some apostles, some teachers, some pastors, some evangelists. Why? For the edifying of the saints, for the perfecting of the body of Christ. If you are not in church, you will never be a complete Christian. You're constantly going to be lacking. There are things you cannot get if you don't go to church. Yeah. There, you will never be the Christian that you could be without church, ever. Doesn't matter who you are, any person, me, you, anyone, any pastor, any evangelist, any man of God, Paul. If Paul did not go to church, Paul would have been lacking in his Christianity. Paul would have areas in his Christianity, things that he would not know, things, you know, things that he would not have been exhorted to do in his Christian life. All of us have flaws, and we have different flaws. You know, I lack in areas where Brother Rick does not lack. And Brother Hall lacks in areas where I do not lack. And we all can help each other with our strengths to help try to fix these problems in our own lives and use each other as examples and learn from their testimonies and get guidance and wisdom from one another where we lack and have weaknesses. You need the local New Testament church. Amen. And not only that, you need to not stop thinking about yourself only. You need to think about your kids. I know I'm repeating some of this, but it's so important. You need to think about your kids, but you also need to think about people at the church. You, you know, 
let's read it one time and I want to close with this because this is so important and there you know leadership's mentioned a few times uh, uh, the congregation is spoken of and alluded to a couple of times but notice in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 it says and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works that similar statement is given in Hebrews 3 and 4 both those passages that's how you can know that this is spoken of in other chapters as well let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That's Paul too, ourselves. He puts himself in there. He needed to be provoked unto love and to good works. You need to be provoked unto love and good works. And not only do you need to, but other people do too. So you need to stop only thinking about yourself. You need to think about other people. And try to put other people first. It's not all about you. It's about other people. Amen. That's a good enough reason to go to church. To other people. I don't want other brothers and sisters to fall out of church. I don't want other brothers and sisters to, to not be provoked unto love and to good works and to eventually fall from Christ. Obviously not lose your salvation. I'm talking about backsliding, of right. course. To fall from serving God. To fall from reading the Bible. To fall you know, out of love with the Bible. You know, you know, just how horrible and terrible would that be where you just have no interest in the Bible, you have no interest in the things of God? I don't want that to happen to, you know, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. And you shouldn't either. And you know a good way to make sure that it doesn't? You know, come to church. And come to church and provoke others unto love and to good works. Come to church and enjoy it and love church and love being with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And, you know, show, show zeal and show interest. That will help one another. You know, if, if one person comes in here and they're not interested, you're going to cause other people not to be interested. You know, if one person comes in here and they're down and they're not having fun or they're just acting like they don't want to be here, everybody, you're, gonna, you're going to, you know, a little leaven leaven at the whole lump. You're going to make other people feel that way. You know, be interested, be excited, love church. You know, provoke others unto love and to good works. And know the importance of church. What's the conclusion of the book of Hebrews? What's some of the things that we learned in the book of Hebrews? We learned, obviously, outside of what I just spoke about, the importance of church. We learned how Jesus and the New Covenant is better than everything about the Old Covenant. He's better than the angels. He's better than man. He's, better, he's a better high priest. He's a better sacrifice. He's better than the Levites, even the Levites themselves, which were you know, priests in general. He's better than them. You know, uh, just everything about the New Covenant is better than the Old Covenant. They're compared. You know? Everything about Jesus is better. Everything about the New Covenant is better. Praise God that we're under the New Covenant and not the Old Covenant. Be thankful for that. Right? He determined the balance of your habitation. He chose for you to be born in this New Covenant. That's something to be thankful for. Right? You know, that's great. You know, praise God for that. That's something good that we've learned. What else? What's the overall? If I had to, if you said one word, what's the book of Hebrews about? And I'm sure everybody knows. Endure. That's what the book of Hebrews is about. Endure. Don't give up. Keep fighting. Stay in the Christian fight. You know, you know, make sure that which is lame isn't turned out of the way. Stay on the path of serving Christ. Don't give up. That's why you see the provocations of stay in church. Because you know what happens? If you don't stay in church, you'll get out of the fight. You'll give up. You're not Superman. You're not, you know, you don't, you're not just like this, this like, you know, uh, 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 titanium robot. You know, that's not, that's not you, my friend. You are mortal. You're mortal man. And you will fall out just as quick as just like how Paul knew that he would. You'd fall out. You don't go to church. You don't go to church consistently. You don't love going to church. You know, you need to have a love of going to church. You shouldn't be looking at how many times you cannot go to church. You should be looking for opportunities to go to church. That just shows where your heart is and that you don't want to be here. If any opportunity you can, you're trying to limit that. You should love church. Want to be here. And you should, you know, want to come here to provoke others, right? So endure, endure. That would be how I would, you know, uh, summarize, if I had to in one word, the book of Hebrews. A very deep book. I hope that you were able to uh, learn a lot. I'm sure that I misunderstood things. Hopefully you understood things that, that maybe I misunderstood. And maybe you can show that to me or whatever it may be uh, you know, if we're talking about the Bible. Uh, but there's a lot of deep doctrine in the book of Hebrews. I hope I was able to enlighten you on a lot of passage and put the book together for you. Point out a lot of things. Cross-reference a lot of things. And I hope that your knowledge of the book of Hebrews 
Hebrews is, is uh, uh, more vast than it was than when we began. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this church. Dear Lord God, we thank you for all of the warnings. Dear Lord... They're so true, dear God, how important the New Testament church is. Uh, uh, so many uh, different good exhortations, strong, good, uh, healthy exhortations in Hebrews chapter number 13, of course. And we're thankful for the God of peace. We're thankful for the great shepherd, dear Lord. Uh, we're, so, we're so thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for everything you've done for us. We thank you for the book of Hebrews, all that we could learn from it, dear God. We ask you that you be with our church, dear Lord, uh, that you would uh, light a fire under all of us, dear Lord. Lord, help us to have a true love, a deep-seated love for the local congregation in our hearts that we would never forsake it as long as we live. And also we pray the same thing for our children. We ask you that you bless all the families that are here and those that were not able to, to come. We love you and in Jesus Christ's name, amen.